Welcome back everyone, day two of DMLC 2021. We hope you've had a wonderful time yesterday and last night, uh, just interacting and engaging with one another, maybe doing some networking, learning something new. Uh, and we're just so thrilled to have you to have you back with us here today. If you missed last night by, by any chance, we released some pretty cool new things coming to the Dance Marathon community. So the first one is the fundraising app. We are thrilled to be presenting this to each and every one of you. And thanks again to our friends from DM at LSU who last year presented on this and it has become a reality. And we are thrilled to offer this fundraising app to the Dance Marathon community. So if you missed it, there's a download option on the screen again. We hope that your donor drives are popping off if you if you have started fundraising. But just as a reminder, we have a fundraising challenge out right now that between but that by tomorrow night, Sunday night at five o'clock Hawaii time, raise $100 through the app and you will get these awesome shiny shimmery stickers that I know everyone is so excited for whenever it comes to back to school time. So uh, make sure that you are utilizing the app. And if you haven't already figured out the milestones and incentives and setting up a Facebook fundraiser is just the same as, as utilizing uh, dance marathon instance previously, you can do all of those things through the app as well. So on average, folks who are utilizing milestones raise three times more than people who don't. And if for incentives, folks raise five times more than people who don't or the average or the average fundraising participant. So we really want to make sure that you're utilizing those those tools and resources that is built right within the app, ease of your fingertips. Uh, and we hope that you're having awesome fundraising success as you're hitting those milestones or as you're hitting the hundred dollars and accomplishing incredible things with this app, please let us know, share in Slack, share in the chat. If you've already hit that fundraising uh, incentive challenge, that hundred dollars, we wanna know, we wanna celebrate you. We know that there's already so many of you that within the past 24 hours, even less than that, have already accomplished this incredible feat. So thank you so much. And we're just so pumped about the app. So let's keep the excitement rolling. Speaking of excitement, how about the Morale Dance Showcase last night? We had students just like pop locking and dropping it. Actually, I don't think that song was in the line dance or any of the line dances, but it should have been because that's just a classic. But we had so much fun, so many great programs. And the folks, we got to give a round of applause to those folks whenever I was asking them some of those questions kind of kind of stumpers but they did fantastic so thank you all again so much for joining us and we look forward to sharing uh, the winner of the morale dance showcase later this evening so um switching gears just a little bit wanting to kind of moving away from our freshest dance moves. Uh, we always wanna look our best and present our best forward. And we're excited to show, showcase a new look for Miracle Network Dance Marathon. You might've seen it in some of our, uh, in some of our imagery uh, throughout the conference and then maybe on the past few months on social media. But I would love to introduce uh, Haley Sitz, who is the Director of Marketing and Communications at Children's Miracle Network Hospitals uh, to talk to us a little bit about our new brand refresh. Hi everyone, I am super excited to share with you some really cool news on the brand side of things here at CMN Hospitals. We know that the charitable landscape is shifting and organizations are focusing on social impact, defining how donations are addressing community and societal issues. So with this in mind, we at CMN Hospitals knew we needed to look at our brand and really better define our relevancy and differentiate ourselves from other children's charities of course, all with the goal of raising more funds for children's hospitals. So as a result, CMN Hospitals and its programs, including Miracle Network Dance Marathon, have gotten a brand refresh. We now have more clearly defined our role in children's healthcare by making the experience of giving as motivating as the impact it has, and by working to strengthen the relationship participants like you have with our organization, as well as our local hospitals, partners, and programs. Included in this refresh are changes you can actually see. So let's take a look at this video.
Right? Okay, I love that video. And we hope you are as excited as we are about this brand refresh. Next steps. So the brand refresh is going to roll out gradually. We really want to be mindful of budgets and timelines. So throughout the next few months, you'll see it incorporated into marketing materials, and you'll get more info from us on what this means for you and your program. So for now, just keep an eye out and see if you can spot the refreshed logo throughout this weekend's materials. You will also be able to access new logos and fonts in the resources section of the newdancemarathon.com site. So excited. Thanks so much, everyone. And back to you, Taylor. Thanks, Haley. Also, shameless plug for our new website. So also, if you missed it last night or, or maybe just getting yourself moving and grooving today, newdancemarathon.com, full, just like facelift. Everything looks awesome. So everything that Haley just talked about is located on the new website. So go check it out. Um, and we're, we're certainly looking forward to rolling that out more with y'all over the course of time. So uh, throughout the weekend, we've been sharing stories and we're excited to share a little bit more stories of our of kids who are treated at local hospitals that represent a wide variety of treatment and services our hospital, our network hospitals are able to provide. So let's roll our next round of Children's Hospital Spotlights. Started crying about something crazy. I think she wanted pancakes and not waffles. She was two, three, so like, we don't know. And her eyes were swollen and it looked like bee stink. As soon as the nurse saw us and she was like, she has pitting edema. And I was like, what? She was five when she had a kidney transplant. Your kidney's usually in your back, but mine's in my stomach right here. I go to the hospital once a month. I get to play Fortnite in the waiting room. My mom is the worst at Fortnite. That was our very first experience at Children's National, and then we became lifelong members, literally, for five years. We lived there. That hospital honestly saved my child's life. If it wasn't for Children's National, I don't know what we would have done. I have a nephew who also was seen at Children's National. He has cancer. Her dad was seen at Children's National. So this is a family-oriented hospital. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you this. I like Chef Barardi. I eat it like every day. I eat it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and snack. It's like biscotti and meatballs, but it's really good. It's from a can, and it's called Chef Barardi. I eat it at school. I eat it at home. I eat it whenever it's dinner time, and I make my own can by myself because I know how to make it. I have two dogs and one cat. My friend's bulldog's name is Zoe. I'm not a cat person. I have a therapy dog, a yellow lab. Her name is Delala and she is 11. And I to give her like command and everything, figure out what she needs to do. I feed Zoe and Delala. That's what I do. And she loves having fun. Cesario would come in once a week, a couple of times a month with his asthma like wheezing. And then LB started coming in occasionally and we there and realized that we need to treat both of the brothers. Every school-based health center has a full-time registered nurse. Tazada comes in every morning to take his asthma medication to control his symptoms. Then if he does have an asthma attack, then he can come in and get the nebulizer for rescue treatment. And that's what Chris has asked us to do, to see these kids in school that have chronic conditions and to make sure they're getting the proper treatment because we know sometimes it's hard for parents to get to their primary care doctor. Since Tazai has been treated daily with his controller medications, he hasn't had any asthma episodes. He hasn't needed to be given a rescue medication in the past six weeks. I have spina bifida and it's like, um, it's really fun to have spina bifida. Like, um, you could, um, get a wheelchair and go and learn how to go fast. And, um, you can also learn how to crawl fast. And I could probably crawl like 10,000 miles and not get tired. I go to the CHOP, um, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And it is very, very, fun to be there. I always love when I'm on the second floor because there's a ginormous ramp I go down. It's like a half a mile long. 
Miss Sarah is one of my favorites, and um, I like to tell you about her. She is very, 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 very nice. If I could raise a million dollars, I would spend it on um, um, caring, um, um, caring brain cancer. Such remarkable stories from kids and families treated across the U.S. and Canada. Um, and at CM and Hospitals, we really believe in embracing what makes our most authentic selves, um, just like all of the kids in the stories that we've heard today. Um, and that embracing our most authentic self is what enables us as an organization to innovate and care on behalf of children everywhere. So when we say that we want to engage everyone in our unrelenting pursuit to ensure that every child has a healthier future, we mean everyone. That's why we're committed to becoming a more inclusive organization of diverse employees, partners, donors, and programs that reflect the communities we serve. We want to establish, as we start to get started in this part of our segment, uh, really just a, a shared definition of what diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DE&I, uh, all means, as we're certainly joining this conversation from different places in our journey and our understanding. So let's start with diversity. The definition of diversity, just so we're all on the same page, is differences in as such social identities. So that could be race, gender identity, age, religion, sexual orientation, class, physical ability, nation of origin, and certainly many others. And can also mean other characteristics such as personality, political affiliation, and so on. Up next, we'll talk and just establish equity. So equity can be defined in really two different ways in, in this instance. So today we're going to reference it from a way of the state where outcomes are not predicted by social identity or status. And it's a fair treatment, access, opportunity, and advancement, while at the same time striving to identify and eliminate, eliminate barriers and ensure that systems are working for everyone, regardless of their identity. And lastly, we'll talk about inclusion. So inclusion being a sense of belonging, which allows people to engage and, con and contribute within an environment, which is the key to reaping the benefits of diversity. So hopefully you've seen many examples in these children's hospital spotlights where we've shared that we've shared throughout the weekend. And we want to make sure we are clear about how DE&I is directly connected to changing kids' health and changing the future. And one of those ways is that you to identify as transgender or gender diverse are traditionally underserved and increasingly, along with their families, are looking to pediatric care providers for guidance, education, and care. According to the Acad American Academy of Pediatrics, the presence and stigma of homophobia in pediatric healthcare environment can lead to psychological distress. So we know that it is so important for kids to receive specialty pediatric care in a safe and welcoming environment as they seek treatment at their local children's hospital. Every year, the Human Rights Campaign evaluates healthcare providers on how they treat LGBTQIA2S plus patients and workers, and 18 Children's Miracle Network hospitals have received perfect scores from the Human Rights Campaign and were named healthcare equality leaders in their last index. The American Academy of Pediatric, Pediatrics also recognizes systemic racism as a social determinant of health that has a profound impact on the health status of children adolescents, emerging adults, and their families. When it comes to children's health, systemic racial disparities affect multiple childhood health issues, including premature birth, the maternal mortality rate, food allergies, and even the rates at which Black and Latinx kids, like LB in the last video and his brother Keziah, are treated for and die of asthma. A recent study also found that Black children are more likely to die after surgery than white children a sobering and devastating fact, and an outcome that we must work every single day to change, and that our children's hospitals are working every single day to change. Indigenous children are also adversely impacted by systemic racism. In 2014, in a 2014 report, the White House found that 40% of Indigenous youth face significant racial barriers, including obesity, type 2 diabetes, mental and substance abuse disorders. In the past year, COVID-19 has disproportionately affected communities of color. Children from Black and Latinx communities are more likely to experience social and economic hardships due to the pandemic. Job losses and, and the recession may leave families unable to meet the needs for their children's basic health, such as food and housing. These, fundament these fundamentals of, of a support system are critical elements to their health and well-being. 
Children's hospitals are on the front lines of protecting the health of the next generation. And as each day they strive to do better and meet the needs of the kids and families we serve, we can recognize that we all can do something and must commit to doing better as well. So today we are here to learn or hopefully continue learning about how we can do just that. And we were careful in today's session to not call this a training. This is not a checkbox instance. We want you to, to begin or continue your learning today and for years to come. Um, so to kick us off in our, our conversations today, we are so happy to have Shirley Rogers, the SCP of Diversity and Inclusion at Children's Miracle Network Hospital join us briefly this afternoon. Um, Shirley has served CMN hospitals for more than 25 years, and we're so happy to have her here with us. Welcome, Shirley. Hello, leaders. I'm Shirley Rogers. I'm the Senior Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and I am so glad to be here with you today. I had the opportunity to address you last year, and I'm thrilled to be back with you again. I hope you enjoyed the video on Tizea and LB, his brother, as they talked about the asthma treatments they were receiving at their hospital. You know, asthma is prevalent in the black and brown community, communities and, and in poor economic communities. So today to hear the incredible treatment taking place for them and for all children is wonderful. But there's great work happening in all children's hospitals like the mental health advancements at Short Air Children's Hospital in Montana or at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, they have a health equity program that investigates how policies and programs can improve the health of historically marginalized communities. There are so many LGBTQA plus services in many of our hospitals. And an example of that is the pediatric LGBTQ clinic at the University of Iowa. It's because of you these amazing services are possible for our marginalized kiddos. And we are so very grateful for everything that you do. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts. But you're here today to learn about DEI as leaders and to hear great wisdom from our incredible panelists. You're going to hear from the panelists. You're going to learn about the term psychological safety and how to build bridges of inclusivity, all of which is extremely important to the success of DEI. But at the crux of DEI, it's about leadership fostering inclusion with steps like continually helping people to show up and be their authentic self every day and to know their uniqueness is valued and wanted at their company, to clearly outline and, st and state the norms and expectations that you have for your inclusion in your company, to also model as leaders, to model the behavior that is expected, and then to also hold ourselves as leaders accountable as well as our teams. But before we can foster inclusion, we have to start by asking ourselves, do we know who we are? Are we holding ourselves accountable in the DEI space? What I'm talking about is implicit bias. It's stereotypes that we may hold about groups or individuals that form outside of our, known, our, our own conscious or our own awareness and everyone everyone has unconscious bias. I love the movie Black Panther, and you may recall when King T'Challa was fighting to keep his kingdom, he gave them hope, to, to give him hope, basically, his mother yelled and told them, show them who you are. And people need to know who you are holistically as a leader. To help identify your unconscious bias, I invite you to take the Harvard Implicit Bias Test. It's free and an excellent tool to help mine your bias. A few examples of the test is there's some on ageism, uh, skin tone, weight, transgender, religion, race, just to name a few. And you know, the results may surprise you and you may disagree, which is okay, but it's not to condemn you. It's merely a tool to make you aware of the things you may not have realized and then decide what you choose to do with that information. What this all comes down to is this, holding ourselves as leaders accountable to our second thought and our first action. 
our first thoughts usually come from implicit biases, internal biases and stereotypes that have absorbed, that we've absorbed over the years from our family, from our circles of influence, from our society, from TV, and just our lived experiences. But luckily, we can do something about it. We must address our internal biases and deal with our own personal, personal stuff before our first action. So while our first thought may need to be addressed and course corrected and unpacked, we can let this experience of more deeply knowing ourselves better inform the first action we take. So today, your takeaway is to take a Harvard implicit test and lean into the results as you deep dive your bias and your amazing worth, as you're on your amazing worthwhile journey into DE and I and the holistic inclusion of yourself and your community and those you work with. Thank you, Shirley. So good to see you. We are so excited for today's panel featuring representatives from higher education and healthcare sectors to talk about the importance of DEI in each of these communities. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Renata Arrington Sanders, an associate professor of pediatrics at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, University School of Medicine, and care provider at Johns Hopkins Children's Center. Her areas of clinical expertise include adolescent sexually transmitted infection and HIV, adolescent transition to adult care, caring for sexual and gender minority youth, and school-based health center needs. She has a joint appointment in the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health Department of Health, Behavior, and Society. Dr. Arrington Sanders earned her MD from the University of Virginia School of Medicine, her residency in internal medicine and pediatrics at the University of Cincinnati and Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Centers, and performed a fellowship in adolescent medicine at Johns Hopkins School, University, Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Her research interests include improving the sexual health of youth with a particular focus on HIV prevention and treatment, community-based efforts to link and engage adolescents at risk for and living with HIV in care. She serves as the co-director of the Pediatric Adolescent HIV AIDS Program and Emerge Gender Clinic, director of the Pre-Exposure Prophylaxis Program, co-director of the Center for AIDS Research, Adolescent and Young Adult Scientific Working Group, and co-investigator of the Johns Hopkins Adolescent Trials Network site. Welcome, Dr. Sanders. Hi. Dr. Yeah, it's so wonderful to be with you. Thanks for being here. Nice to be here. Thank you. And next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Carroll. Um, Dr. Talia K. Carroll is the Vice President for DEI at Oklahoma City University, where she leads campus-wide efforts and works closely with students, staff, and faculty towards strategic and meaningful change. Dr. Carroll is an adjunct professor in higher education and student affairs leadership program at the University of Northern Colorado and the founder of Kinetic Con Connections Consulting. Through living abroad in Portugal, Singapore, and Spain, as well as traveling extensively with her military family, Dr. Carroll has leveraged her global experiences to build a foundation for her DEI practice. Her enthusiasm for intentional engagement with DEI practices, policies, and changes shapes her worldview and informs her commitment to broadening perspectives and scaling impact. As the owner of Kinetic Connections Consulting, Dr. Carol thrives in her capacity to invigorate and encourage the personal and professional growth of individuals, organizations, and businesses through transformative coaching and consulting on diversity, inclusion, equity, and justice, strategic or strategy and goal setting, leadership development, and value positioning. Dr. Carroll earned a PhD in higher education from Penn State University, an MED in adult and high, higher education, and a BA in English from the University of Oklahoma. So good to be with you, Dr. Carroll. Thank you for having me. And finally, I'd like to introduce Amber Shavardi Houston, who currently serves as an executive director for the National Association for Campus Activities and Educational Foundations. In this role, Amber works alongside the board of directors and trustees to bring the association's strategic goals to life and to advance NACA's vision of creating college communities where everyone belongs. Amber graduated from Pittsburgh State University with a bachelor's degree in communication studies and leadership. She earned a master's degree in counseling and student personnel from Eastern U Illinois University and earned the certified association executive designation. Prior to beginning her current position, Amber served as the first female COO for a men's fraternal organization. 
She held various professional positions with Delta Sigma Phi National Fraternity. Amber is an active volunteer for her sorority, Alpha Sigma Alpha, currently serving as the National Vice President and Treasurer. Thank you so much for being here, Amber, welcome. Um, well, we are so happy to have all of you here today and given the goals of, of our discussion, would love if each of you would start maybe by defining the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion to your sector. Um, Dr. Arrington Sanders, how about we start with you? Sure. Well, um, first I wanted to just spend a few minutes talking about what diversity, inclusion, and equity are, um, and then how it applies to the um, human sector or caring in medicine. And so diversity really speaks to the broad um, differences that exist, human differences that exist found in society at large, right? So everyone is different, everyone is unique. And so that's what diversity speaks to. Inclusion really speaks to making sure that all those differences are welcomed and accepted and all those differences are treated equally um, so that there's no preference to one difference or the other. So it really speaks to acceptance around race, ethnicity, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, um, origin, country of origin. Um, so, so many, many facets, right? So that we can think about. And then equity is really speaking to those distribution of resources. So we really have to think about that while you may have, while individuals may come from diverse backgrounds, they may also have different circumstances that um, create um, differences in outcomes. And so equity really speaks to making sure that those resources are allocated equitable, right? So that individuals that need the most resources get the most resources and individuals that don't, they don't need as many resources. And so we really want in medicine to make sure that our health care is equitable, right? So that we're making sure that those that need the resources get those resources where they need it. That's different from equality where everyone might get the same resources, but it may not necessarily meet those needs. And so the purpose of healthcare is really to make sure that healthcare is equitable, right? It's accessible, that it removes all those structural um, constraints, um, structural barriers that actually prevent people from having a good health outcome and, and reaching their true goals and their views um, and, and, and a healthy life, right? So um, we're recognizing that there are differences, but we're working actively to make sure we're removing all of those barriers. Absolutely. Um, and I know in just a, a few moments ago, we talked about um, a variety of examples where equity really comes into play in children's health and how important it is for us to be aware of disparities of healthcare um, so that we can actively work to address them. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Arrington Sanders. And Amber, what do you think? What do you feel is the importance of DEI to the space that you work within? You know, I have the opportunity and privilege of working with so many student leaders and the staff from colleges and universities across the country that support students. And we approach DEIA work in a way that enables and positions students to be those change agents. You know, student leaders, you all have the ability to create a movement where you can create a more inclusive and accessible community, whether that be with a dance marathon program or whether that be something in your local community and really promoting the importance of equitable and accessible healthcare for everyone. And so we approach it where there's an, you know, we are equipping students and student leaders to think about where there's, you know, uh, imbalance of power and not that appropriate balance of accessibility. And so in empowering students to identify where there needs to be a change and then be that change agent and create that grassroots effort to call for the change. Um, you know, there are 2,000 people here, you know, celebrating the good work and the importance of accessible healthcare. And so, you know, challenging each and every one of us to think about where we can ask 
and lead for change in our local communities. And so NACA, we come at it of how do we give you, the student leaders, the resources that you need to recognize when a space is not inclusive and then give you additional resources so that you can say everybody deserves this and here's how we help position change to happen. Absolutely, and I know um, we've shared with many of our um, presenters that inclusive presenter guidelines um, from NACA and some other great resources that we'll make sure we share in Slack as well. Um, so Dr. Carroll, um, related, related to that, what do you see as the importance of DE&I in higher education? Um, there are a number of ways I can think about diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, access. I appreciate Amber really highlighting the A and just wanted to say access in case folks weren't um, really uh, grasping what the A was. We want to be really thoughtful about making our spaces accessible. So when I think about the importance of higher ed um, and DEI overlap, um, I think about self. Um, we, we, and I'll, I'll say maybe a little bit more about this later, but we, we tend to really lean towards thinking about and engaging around others, but we haven't taken the time to think about self. And I really engage in conversations with um, students in particular about being intentional about identifying self. So when I am in space with folks, I like to talk about my blackness and my womanhood as inextricably connected, right? They really um, inform how I show up in the world. I talk about identifying as non-disabled. I am cisgender, right? I, right, there's so many, I'm educated, right? I have three degrees. All of these things really inform how I get to move in the world. I hold privileged identities. I hold marginalized identities. Um, and those can really shape and shift um, both perception of how others experience me um, and then how I experience others. So when I think about higher education, it's this place for learning and discovery and excitement. And it's a place for students in particular, right, to explore um, and be in space where not only are they exploring who they are and their own lived experience and identity, they're doing so with their peers. Um, and this is where we get to learn about the importance of um, honoring the lived experiences of other people. It's, it's about really being an inquiry and being curious um, and building relationship in really genuine and meaningful ways. Um, and so I, I just, it's important, right? We think about higher ed as this um, democratic society and place where we can bring our whole selves to uh, the space. And so I, I like for folks to be able to think about it in that way. Um, that you bring yourself, you think about the, the, the you think about other people intentionally, um, and situate yourself in a space of learning. So when you leave uh, the academic enterprise, you've graduated, you are able to engage and build and nurture relationships with people in ways that maybe others can't, because higher education is uh, the place to engage more deeply. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Dr. Carroll. And I think. You know, when we're talking about bringing our whole selves to an experience or to a place and to community, um, I'd love if you'd share a little bit about your dissertation work, because I think it would really be of interest to our attendees and, and something that, that many of them maybe can relate to as they navigate their experience in higher ed. Absolutely. Um, it's been a while since I defended that thing. Um, <laughs> So um, I, I haven't been super connected to uh, the work in a while, but I explored how um, academically talented Black women navigated their experiences thinking about um, and just experiencing race and gender. And so I, I learned through these experiences of these, these very intelligent, excellent Black women right, that they were sort of navigating these two lives of trying to show up again as their full selves and really trying to navigate these norms that were not created for folks of color in higher ed. And so I got to experience this articulation from these black women of like, I want to show up, I want to be seen, I want to be known as intelligent, I want to be called on, I want to be picked for labs. Um, and the, the group of women um, are, were specifically in STEM. And so these women are navigating, right, difficult coursework, um, these high expectations that um, all students experience. And so I 
really wanted to honor these students' voices um, and really to say out loud to you all here um, that, again, how you present and bring your identities to spaces um, can really impact right, your life course. And so we want to be really intentional and thoughtful about how we're engaging with people and what their lived experiences might be. And if they are creating barriers, right, or if they're creating more access. And so I really feel grateful for those students sharing their lived experience and, and being able to highlight, especially as we think about the number of folks of color who are in the medical profession and the importance of really increasing um, and broadening participation in STEM and in the medical field, um, I, I honor them. And, and some of them have already graduated and I know are doing great work. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Carroll. And um, I know that when we kind of spoke ahead of the conference a little bit, and I think related to this, um, Amber and I were talking a lot about the idea of creating psychologically safe spaces. And I think that that is something that as campus and hospital advisors and as students who host major events on campus and who bring together, you know, small and large groups of people very often um, and kind of create your own corner of campus, your own small community, that that is something that that each of us really have the power to do. So Amber, I was wondering if you could kind of share what, what how would you define a psychologically safe space and, and what are some of the things that we can do to facilitate that? So something that we have done in campus activities is created brave spaces. And, and that's the term that we've used is a brave space that allows people to come together to explore, to learn, and hopefully that safe space that it allows and promotes vulnerability. Oftentimes what we have observed and, and I have observed is you, you so badly want to say the right words. You want to be perfect in your wording. And unfortunately, sometimes that prevents from participating in a conversation because you don't want to make a misstep. And a brave space is bringing people together and promoting that vulnerability and promoting learning for people to be able to learn from each other and, and talk about experiences. But knowing that my experience may be different from yours because we have different identities, that's okay. And it's okay for me to ask questions. And it's okay for that person to recognize that they have a different experience because they have a different privilege. And so brave spaces are really important because they help us learn and they help us learn to understand. And, and the, but the, it is important to know that it's okay to not be perfect in our wording and that through not being perfect, we're going to learn and, and to uh, be excited for each other and to promote the discovery that happens. So that's important to happen on a college campus. That's important to happen in our communities, with our churches, with our hospitals. With So if, if you don't have any brave spaces where you currently are, I, I encourage you to create one and, and ask, you know, whether that's in your student programming that's happening, whether that's in the hospital and health space to say, hey, let's, let's be okay with stumbling with our words, but let's, let's learn from each other. And, and so we use the term brave spaces. And I, I hope that that's something that you all can, can borrow and, and leverage and utilize and, um, and even use within your own families and friends. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, important to note, and this is something that we set as a, an expectation for our collaboration meetings, which um, many of our students and staff joined in June, um, that, you know, as we create those conversations, we need to be pushing our growing edge, you know, to get out of our comfort zone. Um, we need to monitor our own airtime. So we need to ask, our, ask ourselves, you know, when can we listen more than we, than we speak? And um, one of the, the last things I think that we've talked about is making sure that in those conversations that we own the impact of our words and actions, regardless of the intent. You know, we may mean very well, um, but we have to accept that there is um, a potential for, um, for harm and, you know, that that harm and, and lived experience is real. And so um, encourage all of, of our students to continue as they create those conversations to really be intentional in how they are. Um, engaging. And I know that that is something that is really important when it comes to um, the care of some of our 
our youngest and, and often uh, most vulnerable populations. And so I was curious, Dr. Sanders, if you could, could talk about what that means within medicine, how, you know, through wraparound services, how, you know, through the work that you do, how do you create safe, you know, brave spaces for your patients to really thrive and to get the care that, that they need? Well, you know, thank you. Um, I think the first thing is we um, have visualizations posted uh, that everyone is welcome in our space, right? So something mm -hmm. physical that tells people, this is a safe space, you're welcome here. Mm -hmm. um, depending, you know, regardless of who you are, what you look like, where you come from, you are welcome. And People, we've heard from teens, we've heard from kids, we've heard from families, they're looking for a visual cue that says, it's okay, this provider is safe. So that visual cue is like the first step, right? And so then from there, really creating that space of confidentiality, um, as you know, you go from children to adolescence, you're really, uh, you know, uh, learning who you are, you're going through a very important and critical developmental stage where you're uh, going through identity formation uh, and in multiple aspects of who you are as an individual. And so you want a space to be able to share that with someone. And what what teens have said, um, children and teens, you know, older children, early teens, later teens have said that they're looking for that space with providers, right? So they're often not getting it at home. They may not be getting it in other places. And so they're looking at for it with providers, and then they're also looking for it with teachers, right? Or other safe adults, right? So they're looking for individuals in their life where they may or may not, it's great if they have it at home, but they may not be getting it at home. So they're looking for someone to be able to share that information. So creating a confidential space that says what you say is, um, is it's okay. You know, if you say, if you say the wrong thing, that's okay too, right? Whatever you say is fine. I'm going to receive that and I'm going to listen and I'm going to nurture what you say. And so then we'll work through that. We'll work through whatever you say, whether it's good or bad or otherwise, right? But confidential spaces are really important. So people know that, that their information is not going to be shared, you know, openly with other people that they haven't actually given that permission to, right? We do say, and we make sure that they know that if they're unsafe, right? If they're um, in harm's way, we may have to share that information. But otherwise, this is a confidential and safe space. We also want to just make sure that you know um, that we see them, right? That we see who they are. Um, you know, you know, people are looking for somebody to say, I acknowledge you. I see you. I see who you um, for who you are, all of it, right? So, and often people don't get the chance to have someone say that. They're looking for acknowledgement. Um, and so having that space of saying, I see who you are and I'm gonna ce celebrate who you are um, and celebrate and, and be with you through the process is really critical. So I think that those are like four key areas um, that we actually focus on within medicine to really help um, all aspects of our youth, regardless of who they are or what medical condition they have, to be able to be the best person that they can be, right? So by um, you know providing that safe space and seeing who they are and then really helping them move forward through adolescence and into adulthood, supporting them, um, we really provide that space to be able to um, be successful as an adult. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that that we've heard from from Mason and from you know so many other kids that have been treated at gender clinics at many of our hospitals that 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 space really makes a world of difference um, and that they can can thrive because care providers like you create that environment. Um, and I know that Dr. Carroll, something that we talked about and and I think is important is how do we make a start in doing that if you know we know that folks who are joining us today are kind of all along different parts of maybe their journey into DEI. So how can we as individuals and or where do you think it's important for us to start um, as we look to try to foster a similar environment um, in the communities that we're a part of? 
Yeah, I, I, I love the question and I always go to self first again, because we don't spend as much time as we probably should really excavating what's inside of us, what has informed how we show up in the world, how we've been socialized to be. Um, I always think about and share a, a funny story. I grew up in the Baptist church and um, grew up with a grandmother who always, I had to wear particular things to go to church, right? And um, so like this socialization process then led me to believe and think that everyone else had to do things the way I did. And so I always like for folks to spend time really understanding uh, the various ways they have engaged in the world and who has influenced those perspectives and those ways of being. So generally when I'm encouraging folks who are sort of at the beginning or like, oh, like I feel overwhelmed and I, and I don't know where to start, um, choose, an, choose one of your own identities and explore more about who you are. Um, and if you're beyond that and you're like, well, I feel like I know myself really well, um, perhaps choose an identity or an experience you don't know much about and do the work on your own. What we don't want to do is burden and task those who hold marginalized identities to teach us. We don't want to do that. You can ask your faculty member to teach you things because they hold expertise in that particular topic or area, but we have access to, to information on the web. We can go to our libraries. And it's super critical that we are doing the work first and then bringing that information to people to maybe engage in a deeper, richer conversation to say, I've learned this thing. I would love to talk to you more about it if you're comfortable and if you're willing, right? We don't, again, want to burden other folks to be the sole educators of us in terms of like our own knowledge acquisition. Um, it's unfair. Um, it, it shows that we're steeped in our own privilege that we just want someone else to do the work for us. And so that's where I would say um, folks can start. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Carol. We, um, we'll talk a little bit more about that and have some resources for you to, to do that as well. Um, so I wanna to move, uh, switch gears a little bit into some questions from our attendees. Um, and our first one is Maya from New York asks, how can we work to make our social media efforts more inclusive? Um, Amber, would you like to answer first? Yes, happy to. So I'm going to pull a, a note from the corporate space, something that I learned from uh, the corporate space of voice of customer. And Blair, I think earlier you mentioned the, the importance of listening to listen. And, and so that's where, you know, I want to borrow something from the corporate space of knowing what is speaks to those that we work with. So oftentimes we, we in our work, we want to make that good effort, but we don't stop and ask where, you know, people in thinking about this question specifically about social media, we need to ask our constituents and say, do you see yourself in our communications and our work? Because we can make an assumption of, oh, we're, you know, we're missing this identity versus asking and learning and learning about, you know, what is it that in our social media efforts, in our efforts to communicate with you, where are we hitting the mark and where do you not see yourself so that we can learn and we can authentically communicate with our student peers, with our community partners, you know, and so the, the work to be inclusive is requires and, and ask of us to continuously learn. Um, so I think the first step is to ask and then to be really thoughtful and intentional about and, and define what does diversity and inclusion and equity mean? You know, we can, it can have different definitions. So I encourage each of you, your institution may have it, your hospital may have those definitions. So keep that visible for you in your planning, but also, and really importantly, seek to understand, seek to learn, bring those together, and then that can come forward in your social media campaigns. Yeah, thanks, Amber. Um, and our next question um, is from Becca in Iowa, who has a, a question for Dr. Arrington Sanders. Um, what makes you hopeful for a more equitable future in pediatric medicine? Uh, well, you know, uh, thanks for that question. I think, you know, if you look at the media, you might be unhopeful. Let's start there. I want to acknowledge that first. There's been a lot in the last 
few years, decades, even this week, right? Uh, where if you turn on the news, you might be overwhelmed. And so uh, it's okay to acknowledge that, right? And it's okay to feel that way. Um, why I'm hopeful is because of the, the teens and the college students that I see that are making changes, right? So they are actually doing uh, the good work on the ground, right? So I am hopeful because while I may see uh, individuals um, on the one hand be not accepting, uh, or I may see laws that come out that are um, anti-trans um, centered, right? I see on the other hand, um, individuals that such as youth that are standing up to that and are actually um, going back to Amber's point, putting out social media messages. You know, I have a TikToker uh, upstairs and, you know, they're putting out these messages that say, no, that's not right. You can't do that. We're going to stop that. And so I think that's what we have to keep encouraging because the youth are the driving force, right? And so we really want to encourage that. And so that's why I'm hopeful because I know that those youth are out there and they're, they're actually on the ground. They're paying attention. Uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement was mm -hmm. driven by youth, by young adults, right? Mm -hmm. So they're on the ground and they're paying attention. So that's why I think we have a, a great opportunity to make a lot of progress. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as we, as we continue to push forward and make progress um, related actually to one of our next questions, um, for Dr. Sand or for um, Dr. Carroll, um, John, one of our students from Indiana, asks, "What do you say to people who think the ENI is a distraction?" So, as we continue to make progress, you know, how do we how do we respond to something like that? That is fascinating to me, right? Um, DEI is a part of all of our lived experience. So, how at all could it be uh, a distraction? We want to really put at the forefront the importance of honoring people, right? So I keep coming back to this because we miss opportunity to honor people and how they show up and how they live their lives. And there are a multitude of ways for any of us to engage in this work and to think about how we can do things better and make the world better. Um, and I, I think about this specifically, we, if we're not really attuned to who we are, we can be in spaces where we cause harm, where we're creating more issues. And so that, that reflection and that reflective energy is so, so important. So we have to think about that. Like, are we helping to create culture that is helpful and good and supportive? Are we contributing to energies that are not helping to move us forward in really positive ways? Thanks, John, for that question. Yeah, and I think that's something that that hopefully as you're having conversations this weekend, that it's something that you as student leaders, as campus and hospital professionals really have the power to shape, um, no matter where you're starting or where your community is. Um, so I know it feels like we could never have enough time. We could have this conversation all weekend. I wish we could um, just stay here and keep chatting. Um, but wanted to kind of wrap up our discussion with something that each of us can do um, to foster a more diverse, equitable, inclusive, just, accessible community, um, whether, you know, wherever we are and whatever our, um, you know, position or sector. So if you were each to, to give us some homework, I know it's summer break for most of our students, but if you were to give us a, a piece of, of homework or a challenge or encouragement, um, what would it be? And whoever can, can start first, go ahead. I'm happy to dive in. Um, it, it's already come up once. And so we can become paralyzed when we don't have the right language, when we're, we're fearful, right? So to push past being paralyzed and take action. Um, so many of us can be in space where we're really tentative and you're like, oh, that, that uncertainty and feeling unsure um, can leave us in space where we're not using our power and our privilege and our talents in really amazing ways. So I encourage you to choose something. If you don't already have something in mind, choose something to do, uh, to take action and to move past any fear or trepidation or that paralyzed feeling. And know that we all feel it. You are not alone. 
I feel it too, even in my work sometimes. And so I send you all the good energy and I'm cheering you on from Oklahoma um, and just look forward to all the great things that you will do um, in your work and in your futures. Thanks, Dr. Carroll. Um, Dr. Sanders, would you want to go next? Sure. I, you know, I, I think that there have been a couple of key themes that have come out today. One has been the importance of self, right? So I really appreciate that. You have to take care of self first, start first here, and then you can actually work with other people. So you have to love yourself. You have to uh, recognize who yourself is. I'm also a cisgender black woman and I own it. You know, when I'm in these meetings uh, and we're talking, we had a meeting yesterday and we talked about race and ethnicity. I said, I am, you know, I want you to see me. So I want you to see who I am. So we have to own that because that is power. So that's the first step. The other step I think is um, really thinking about how do we engage with others that may be different than us or maybe um, in different spaces? How do we work together to move things forward even when it doesn't feel good and feel right? And um, you know, I was trying to prepare for today and I, I remember this quote from Coach K about basketball. Uh, and, you know, Coach K is at Duke University, and he says, basketball is like the five fingers on your hand. Um, you know, you get them together and you have a fist. And I was like, hmm, what does this mean? Well, it really means that the fist, your hand, and I'm not left-handed, so I should really hold up my right hand so I don't look so awkward, but the fist is much stronger than each individual finger. So if you can actually work collectively, like collective responsibility is like, you know, let's be collective about our responsibility and let's, you know, be caring, thoughtful and engaging others that may be different um, because then we'll be that fist will be so much stronger than just that individual finger. So that's what I would give as homework. Just try to think collectively, think of someone else. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Arrington Sanders, and love a good Coach Kate quote. Um, and Amber, what would you what would you share as your homework or challenge for each of us? So I, I wrote down two final thoughts as we you know wrap up our session together. Where you see inequities, be relentless. Be relentless. Call, write, be vocal to your local legislators. Your voice is so important to create that change and address inequities. So please be strong, be relentless, and you know, know that knocking on those doors over and over again will ultimately create that change that we need to make a more equitable world, but it's going to take a constant effort, and we don't always see the progress right away, so be relentless. And my other departing thought would be, you know, do some homework on any, you know, your unconscious bias. We, we all have an unconscious bias. And if you have an opportunity to participate in a workshop, to do some reading, self-reflection, we all have it. And it, and it is a part of who we are. And so kind of going back to that self dis, you know, discussion, that, a theme that we've had in this discussion, it's to know what our unconscious bias are so that we can work to be aware of them and um, not let them prevent us learning and growing and evolving as a person. But really, gosh darn it, the, the 2,000 plus of us participating in this mm -hmm. conference this weekend, be relentless, find your voice, and ask for change, and, and don't give up until we see that change. Yeah, thank you, Amber, and thank you all so, so much for for being here with us today, for inspiring us. Um, I know that these discussions will continue with our, our students, our attendees um, today, tomorrow, as they get together, and we hope for many years to come. Um, and we are so grateful to each of you and to our students and attendees, our campus and hospital professionals who continue to grow and adapt in the ways that they continue to show up and learn and advocate for and build a more inclusive and equitable organization. Um, so I wanna chat briefly about where you can find some resources. So we'll share some of the things noted here um, in Slack and some of the resources um, and ways you can connect to learn more about our wonderful panelists. Um, and if you didn't attend the collaboration meeting breakouts focused on DEI, um, you can check those out on demand on the site. And we encourage you to attend this afternoon's workshop. 
Um, so with all that you have learned today, that we've all learned today, we want to encourage you. Um, Shirley Rogers, our SCP of diversity and inclusion, loves this quote from Maya Angelou, and I, I have to say the same, that when you know better, you do better. And we hope that, that we all feel that we know a little bit better um, just after our short conversation today and that you continue to keep doing better. And we can't wait to see all the ways that you can continue to learn and do better in the coming year. And so thank you all so, so much for being here. And um, I know that some of our, our organizations who applied for awards, which Taylor's gonna talk about now, um, actually wrote in their applications about you know, how they're working to become a more equitable and accessible organization. So I think, um, Taylor, it's time for our next round of award winners. Yeah, Blair, thank you so much. And thank you all to our to our panelists for being here with us today and, and just sharing your, your energy and expertise um, and your willingness to help us push and, and grow our learning edge. We appreciate it so much. Uh, but as, we're, as Blair mentioned, we had uh, many of our submissions for awards this year, highlighted efforts and the great work that you're already doing in advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion and in our fantastic examples that we have to share with you today. But as Blair just mentioned that whenever you, when you know better, you can start doing better. And as we look to these awards, these are such an opportunity to, to learn and grow from one another and continue to expand our opportunity for innovation. Um, so let's step out our first round of award or our next round of awards. And our first winner is a great example of how they have incorporated DE&I into their organization this past year. The Organization Management Award recognizes a dance marathon organization that demonstrates success in areas such as board and committee structure, retreats, internal communication, and data tracking. This program leaned into their commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts within their organization by developing an empowerment team that provided opportunities for students to learn about DE&I. Moving forward, they will continue to expand their empowerment team and continued learning for their entire leadership team based on feedback they've received. Congratulations to the winners of the Organization Management Award, University of Iowa Dance Marathon. Keeping in touch and finding ways to involve alumni while demonstrating to current participants that involvement does not end at graduation are key to any program's long-term growth. This year's award winner worked with their small but mighty alumni group to create incentives for their spring push day while also creating new alumni fundraising initiatives. Through these efforts, their alumni group had their largest fundraising year to date. Congratulations to the winner of the Alumni Engagement Award, Pitt Dance Marathon at the University of Pittsburgh. The Digital Media Award recognizes a program's efforts in utilizing digital media to highlight a campaign, educate new and existing audiences, or tell a story. This year's award winner utilized digital media to expand their reach throughout their community. By taking over a popular social media account, utilizing their official university news source, and setting up interviews with local press stations, they were able to bring awareness to their organization at key times throughout the year. Congratulations to the winner of the Digital Media Award, Demonthon at DePaul University. The Marathon Programming Award recognizes an organization that implemented exceptional and engaging programming during a dance marathon event positively contributed to the program experience. To create this experience, this program engaged their lower, middle, and high school in different unique ways. Due to more clear and specific programming, event retention grew and students continued to talk about how amazing their dance marathon experience was. Congratulations to the winner of the Marathon Programming Award, Royalthon at the First Academy, a partner of Nightthon at the University of Central Florida. The Marathon Programming Award recognizes an organization that implemented exceptional and engaging programming during their dance marathon event that positively contributed to the participant experience. To create this experience, this program adapted to a new location where each room had activities that included letter writing, cornhole, educational boards of the hospital and dance marathon, and much more. 
Utilizing both broadcasting and in-person activations, there was always a challenge or activity to engage participants. Congratulations to the winner of the Marathon Programming Award, Hatterthon at Stetson University. Many programs were forced to pivot from an in-person to virtual experience for their participants, donors, alumni, and community. The Virtual Marathon Programming Award recognizes an organization that implemented exceptional and engaging virtual programming. The program that won this award went above and beyond with virtual programming, creating opportunities for engagement and fundraising through activities such as Kid Art Auction, Dance Marathon Bachelorette, and even a Miracle Kid cooking show. The success of their virtual event would not have been possible without the preparation and organization of their entire team, including spending over 50 hours in virtual rehearsals the week leading up to their main event. A huge congratulations to the winner of the Virtual Marathon Programming Award, Dance Marathon at San Diego State University. Amazing work and congratulations again to these programs. We are always just the most impressed with all you do to innovate and take your programs to the next level. And these awards show just that. So congratulations and great work again. All right, folks, it's now time to move into our live workshop sessions. We have, there have been months and months of preparation from CMN hospital staff and your peers and, and programs from across the country who are gonna be presenting on some great peer-to-peer -peer best practices. You can find the link to join these sessions live. Um, we're gonna drop it in the chat here in just a second, but it will also be um, on the registration site on the agenda page where you've been going to access all of these sessions. You'll be able to find them there. Uh, you'll be able to choose two different sessions and then um, you know have some time just learning and growing with your peers. And then we'll meet back here in a couple hours to, to close out DMLC for this year. So we'll see y'all in a little bit. Thanks so much. Oh, 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 o